Hello, everyone, and welcome to FuseNet's Food Security Outlook Briefing for West Africa for the period of October 2022 through May 2023. My name is Lita Branham, and I'm a Senior Food Security Analyst at FuseNet, and I will be giving this presentation today. So today uh, we will first give a quick overview of FuseNet's approach to early warning analysis, as well as an overview of the IPC 3.1 scale before turning towards our key messages for this briefing. We'll focus on providing a regional overview for West Africa today, though in that regional overview, we will focus on two key areas of concern, which are Burkina Faso and Mali. So before we dive into our analysis, I'll briefly describe the process used by FuseNet for projecting outcomes. We start with a knowledge base for each of our countries that focuses on the key livelihoods of the populations we're analyzing, in particular, how they access food and income. We then collect information using both primary and secondary data, which is used to help build assumptions about what is most likely with respect to key drivers of food insecurity, such as rainfall or food prices during the outlook period. We then project future access to food and income sources and identify the most likely food security outcomes for the next eight months. We then use those outcomes to classify food security using the IPC or Integrated Phase Classification 3.1 scale. This is a look at that scale. The IPC scale consists of five phases of increasing severity. And if you look at the top of this slide, you can see the different phases and the colors associated with them. They begin at none at the household level or minimal at the area level, which is IPC phase one, and they increase all the way to catastrophe at the household level or famine IPC phase five at the area level. And phases th three and higher require urgent humanitarian food assistance because households either have food consumption gaps or are engaging in unsustainable coping strategies to mitigate those gaps. As we go from the household level classification from the top of the slide to the area level classifications at the bottom of the slide, at least 20% of a given area's population must meet the criteria for a given phase in order for that area to be classified in that phase. However, there are likely households experiencing different phases within that same area. In FuseNet's food security mapping, we use exclamation marks to denote areas that would likely be at least one phase worse in the absence of humanitarian assistance. I would also note that in countries where we do not have a presence, we do remote monitoring. Here we use the same scale to classify acute food insecurity, but we classify at the national level based on the highest area level phase classification observed. And these countries are mapped with a single phase classification outlining the country. I would also note that while West Africa typically uses CH phase classifications, FuseNet uses IPC compatible mapping, and therefore we refer to the IPC scale, though these two scales are comparable in their definitions of the phases. So now turning towards our key messages for the region. Harvests began in October across the Sahel, which improved local food availability and income from the sale of crops. Despite average regional production, localized dryness, flooding, and conflict led to below, below average production in many countries in the region. Market supply has gradually increased with the harvest, but remains below average. Demand for staple foods remains atypically high due to the disrupted trade flows and high institutional demand to replenish stocks. Staple food prices are expected to remain above average due to high transportation costs, disrupted trade flows, localized below average production, and the high cost of imported food. Persistent insecurity and armed conflict continue to be the main driver of acute food insecurity across the region. Conflict has disrupted livelihood activities and market functioning and trade flows, as well as transhumanist movements, and has led to massive population movements in the region. As of late November 2022, there were over 2.4 million IDPs in the Central Sahel and over 6 million IDPs in the Lake Chad Basin. Localized below-average production, high levels of conflict, and above-average price 
reports are driving crisis IPC phase three outcomes in the Tilaberi and Tawa regions of Niger, in Northern Mali, Northern Burkina Faso, as well as in worst affected departments of Northwest and Southwest Cameroon, the Central African Republic and parts of Northern Nigeria. Food assistance needs are expected to remain high in West Africa through 2023. Northern Burkina Faso remains of highest concern where emergency IPC phase four outcomes are expected in Sum, Udalan, and Yaga provinces between February and May 2023. So now looking at our regional overview for West Africa, we'll start by looking at the seasonal calendar for West Africa in a typical year. And we're currently in the post-harvest period in the Sahel, um, which is the top calendar on this slide. And this period also coincides with livestock migration from north to south as they follow the descent of rains. As we move into the new year, we're currently moving into the period for off-season off harvests in January. And in the southern part of the region, uh, the bottom calendar on this slide, which um, encompasses southern Nigeria and most of Cameroon, the October to December period coincides with the second rainy season, and January is the start of the second season harvest. As we look into the projection period from February to, Ma to May, this will coincide with the end of the off-season harvest and the beginning of the pastoral lean season as livestock begin their migration northward in the Sahel. In southern Nigeria and Cameroon, February to May covers the main rainy season and most of the main agricultural lean season that typically takes place starting in April. So looking now towards food security in the region, conflict continues to be the main driver of acute food insecurity in West Africa and is leading to high levels of displacement, the disruption of typical livelihood activities and contributes to poor production and disrupted market flows, which then influences price trends. The graph on this slide is showing conflict events per year from 2019 through 2022, though I would note the data for the end of December 2022 is not yet available. And as we can see on this graph, 2022 saw a similar number of conflict events in then compa when compared to 2021. And while Nigeria continues to represent the country with the most conflict events, shown in dark green on this graph, incidences were similar to last year in Nigeria, driven mainly by a recent improvement in insecurity in northeast Nigeria. However, we've seen a notable increase in conflict in Mali, shown in blue on this slide, and in Burkina Faso, shown in orange. So taking a closer look at conflict in Burkina Faso, as has been the case in past years, 2022 was, once again, the year with the highest uh, incidences on record. Between January and November 2022, the number of security incidences involving militant groups was nearly 60% higher than the same period in 2021. And even during the 2022 rainy season, which is when we typically see a respite in conflict incidences, JNIM, one of the country's most active armed groups, continued to carry out frequent attacks in the Sahel, Nord, Centre Nord, and Est regions. Additionally, armed groups are continuing to attempt to expand their control throughout the country, carrying out increasing attacks in the Buku du Muhun region and along the borders with Cote d'Ivoire and Togo. Uh, this conflict is continuing to drive high levels of displacement. Um, in November 2022, Burkina Faso registered over 1.9 million IDPs, which represents an increase of 20% since last year. And um, Burkina Faso now represents over 60% of IDPs in the Sahel region. Additionally, armed groups are increasingly conducting attacks along main roads in Udalan, Seno, and Yaga provinces. And increased insecurity along these main roads and the new tactic of encircling town centers of municipalities and restricting any movement in or out is leading to an increase in municipalities under blockade. Jibo in Sum province has remained under blockade since February of 2022. And we'd also like to point out Seba in Yaga province, which has been under blockade in August. Um, though this map on this slide is um, dates from August of 2022, it still represents um, a close understanding of 
which municipalities would be considered to be under blockade, shown in pink on this map. And these blockaded municipalities are really only accessible via armed escort or airdrop, which is irregular and difficult to carry out. FuseNet would also estimate that additional municipalities are also either emptied out or under blockade in Seno, Sum, Udalan, Yaga, and Kompianga provinces. Looking at conflict in Mali, Mali has also registered an increase in conflict instances by about 30% in 2022 compared to 2021. And while Mopti continues to be the region with the highest overall conflict in incidences, as we can see in uh, green on this slide here, given the prolonged nature of conflict there, humanitarian access remains more or less possible. However, a sharp increase in conflict in Manaka since March of 2022 and the volatile nature of that conflict has significantly reduced humanitarian access in the region and has led to an increase in displacement as well. In Manaka alone in 2022, um, an increase of about 160% in the number of conflict incidences were noted compared to 2021. So this increased conflict in Mali has led to a steep increase in displacement this year, particularly in Manaka, where nearly 30,000 new IDPs were registered by midway through 2022. According to the IOM displacement tracking matrix, conflict, whether armed conflict or intercommunal conflict, accounted for about 97% of all displacement this year in Mali. Turning now towards production, Regional production was near average for most staple grains, thanks to overall good rainfall across the region. The graph on the left is showing regional production for most staple grains, most of which have remained stable this year. The map on the right is showing cropping conditions as of October, and um, we can see by the green on the map um, that the region has registered relatively good conditions. However, localized below average production was observed in parts of Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Nigeria, and Chad, um, as we can see in the yellow, with the yellow and red on this map. Um, conflict that reduces access to fields and inputs is the main driver of this below average production, as we can see. However, this year, flooding in parts of Mali, Chad, and Nigeria also led to localized crop losses. In Nigeria, for example, some of the worst flooding in the past decade was observed in the north along the Komodugu Yobe River Basin, as well as in the south along the Benue and Niger rivers. And the Nigerian Emergency Management Agency, uh, also known as NEMA, um, indicates that floods affected over 2.5 million people across the country and over 3.6 million hectares of land, which included roughly 8% of the total hectares cropped for main staples. I'd also note that production was also impacted by reduced availability of fertilizer in the region. In some countries, such as in Burkina Faso, for example, government subsidies and distributions of fertilizer took place too late in the season to be utilized properly. Off-season production is ongoing under generally favorable conditions, given the good rainfall over the past season. NDVI, which is essentially a measurement of greenness, shown on this slide here, um, shows relatively good conditions across the agro-pastoral band of the Sahel, um, where off-season production typically takes place. However, stagnant water from flooding in Nigeria and Chad, as well as conflicts in parts of Nigeria, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali, have limited planting for off-season production. These good rainfall conditions have also led to good water and pasture availability for livestock, whose body conditions have seasonally improved. Additionally, we tend to see a decrease in incidences between farmers and herders in years of good rainfall because livestock have sufficient pasture to eat rather than encroaching on farmland for feed. Macroeconomic constraints persist across the region, with Burkina Faso reaching record levels of inflation. As additionally, in Nigeria, the inflation rate is just over 21%, the highest it's been in nearly two decades. The continued poor macroeconomic conditions are attributable to food supply disruptions due to widespread flooding, the depreciation of the Nigerian Naira, high transportation costs, um, low foreign reserves, and revenue from trade, notably from oil exports. 
While inflation is still relatively lower in Mali, inflation on average has been at less than 2% um, in past years, but increased to nearly 10% this year, representing a significant deterioration in the macroeconomic situation following economic sanctions against Mali that was imposed by ECOWAS until about August of 2022. Looking at the graph on the right, Fuel prices also remain significantly above last year and the five-year average, particularly in Nigeria. As a result, um, in Nigeria, most people are forced to purchase fuel on the informal market, where prices are roughly 25% higher than the current official market fuel prices. Regional tra trade flows are hampered by significantly high transportation costs that I just mentioned, as well as persistent and escalating insecurity in the different conflict hotspots. The map on the left shows markets and trade flows in the Liptako Gorma, while the map on the right shows markets and trade flows in the Lake Chad Basin. And looking at the map for the Lake Chad Basin, there's been a, a relative improvement in the security situation in this region, represented by an increase in markets and trade routes functioning at normal activity, shown in green, over the last year. However, if we were to compare this to the Liptako Gorma map, conflict is significantly disrupting markets and trade flows in the Liptako Gorma region. Um, as we look towards the most conflict affected parts of this region, particularly in the Sahel region of Burkina Faso, Gao and Manaka in Mali, and in Tilaberi, Niger, we see markets move from some to slight, from some slight disruption shown in yellow to significant disruption uh, in brown um, to little to no activity shown by red on the map. And it's important to note that while these maps are showing main markets in key areas, most secondary markets in these regions are reliant on these primary markets for their supply, and therefore many of these secondary markets are no longer functional at all. Taking a quick look at staple food prices, across the region, staple food prices have remained significantly above average. Despite some seasonal decreases following the harvests in October, the price for sorghum, maize, and millet are trending between 25 and 100% above average across the region, as we can see on the graph on the left. The increase in the price of staple foods is mainly driven by increased demand to replenish institutional stocks, the disrupted trade flows I mentioned earlier, as well as the increase in global prices of cereal, which is in turn increasing both imported and locally produced commodities. Prices are highest in conflicted affected parts of the region. The graph on the right is showing the price for millet in Jibo, Burkina Faso. And as we can see by the red line, in Jibo, prices are over 300% above average and have continued to increase throughout the post-harvest period. Information from key informants indicate that markets are no longer functioning in Jibo and that there's little food available. And as I mentioned earlier, households are increasingly reliant on armed escorts or humanitarian airdrops for food. The last one occurred in late November. And while FuseNet doesn't have much information on the official quantity of food distributed via airdrop, information suggests that it's typically only enough to, co to cover food needs for about two weeks. Across the region, prices for livestock have generally been above average due mainly to reduced supply of livestock from Nigeria because of the depreciation of the currency and Mali's ban on livestock exports earlier this year, as well as due to improved body conditions for livestock. Um, the exception, of course, is for worst conflict-affected parts of the Sahel, where large-scale pillaging and displacement has forced many households to atypically sell off their livestock in order to avoid losses related to pillaging or livestock deaths due to reduced grazing for pastures. Despite these globally above average prices for livestock, they haven't been able to keep pace with the high staple food prices in the region, and therefore terms of trade for livestock to cereals have declined across the board. The graph here shows the terms of trade of goat to millet across different markets in the Sahel. Uh, in 2022, shown in gray, compared to 2021 in red and the five-year average in blue. 
And this means that the value of livestock related to that of cereals, in this case millet, has declined, reducing pastoral households' ability to purchase livestock on the market, or sorry, to purchase grain on the market. And they must now sell more livestock to purchase a, the same amount of millet. Looking at our key assumptions through May of 2023, we anticipate the conflict events will likely continue at currently observed levels and remain above average throughout most of the region. This conflict will continue to disrupt agricultural activities and typical pastoral corridors, as well as cause displacement and disrupt market functioning. We anticipate a near average off-season production for the region, though with localized uh, losses in flood and conflict affected areas. Staple food prices will remain above average. This is driven by the continued high institutional demand, localized below average production, and high transportation costs. We can see this above average trend on the graph on this slide, which is showing observed and projected prices for maize in Ouagadougou um, through May of 2023. Livestock prices will also remain average to above average. However, they will not be able to keep pace with these high staple food prices, and therefore terms of trade will remain below average. We anticipate near average incomes, except in conflict affected areas. And this is really driven by um, the increase in demand for off-season agriculture, which will be near average, as well as average incomes from the sale of wood and charcoal and seasonal migration. However, we anticipate below average income from mining as mines are typically located in some of these war conflict affected areas. Household food stocks will deplete atypically early in conflict affected areas, and this will lead to an atypically early lean season, particularly in the Liptaco Gorma region. So looking now towards our most likely food security outcomes, the map on the left is showing projected food security outcomes for December 2022 through January 2023, and this continues to represent the post-harvest period. Most households are continuing to consume food from their own production and earn income from the sale of crops or off-season agricultural labor, which allows them to meet their food consumption needs. We anticipate widespread minimal IPC phase one outcomes throughout the region and stress outcomes in areas impacted by rainfall anomalies whether that be flooding in Nigeria and Chad or below average rainfall in northern Niger. However, crisis IPC phase three persists in worst conflict affected areas where households ability to engage in the agricultural season was likely disrupted and households have significantly below average production or income from agricultural labor. As we move into the projection period, uh, looking at the map on the right, which shows food security outcomes for February to May 2023, we'll see widespread stressed IPC phase two outcomes, particularly in the pastoral regions of Mauritania, Mali, Niger, and Chad, as the pastoral lean season takes place between March and June. Additionally, crisis IPC phase three outcomes will persist in worst conflict affected areas and expand into some neighboring areas as households, particularly in the Liptaco Gorma region, deplete their household food stocks atypically early. Two areas of concern within the region remain northern Mali and northern Burkina Faso, of which we'll now take a bit of a closer look. So looking at Mali, while most of the country will face minimal outcomes in the post-harvest period, thanks to the availability of the harvest, as well as the improvement in livestock body conditions and the seasonal improvement in food and income sources, much of Kedal, Gao, Timbuktu, and Mopti will be in stressed IPC phase two, as insecurity is likely has likely reduced agricultural engagement and reduced pasture area for livestock. In worst affected parts of Gao and Manaka, households are unable to meet their food needs as the volatile nature of the conflict has reduced access to fields and led to significant population displacement and even the complete abandonment of some villages. As we move into the production period, an expansion of crisis, IPC phase three into Mopti, is anticipated as these households deplete their food stocks atypically early and face an early lean season. Looking now at Burkina Faso, in Sum and Udalan provinces of Burkina Faso, emergency IPC phase four outcomes persist as most households were unable to participate in the agricultural 
in the agricultural season and blockades of communities is persisting, particularly that of Jibo. Information from key informants, as well as from the October 2022 National Food Security Survey, indicate that many households in these regions are engaging in increased levels of begging, going a full day and night without eating, which is in turn resulting in increased levels of visible acute malnutrition. Emergency IPC Phase 4 is expected to persist in Sum and Udalan provinces as households continue to sustain significant consumption gaps. In Yaga, the blockade of Seba shows no signs of abating either, and households will likely sustain large consumption gaps or, or will turn to liquidating their assets, similar to what we've seen in Sum and Udalan. Additionally, we anticipate that a small percentage of households in these blockaded areas are facing catastrophe IPC phase five outcomes. And with that, I'm happy to conclude and answer any questions. Thank you.